This episode is sponsored by Swap.com. Swap.com makes it easier than ever to buy and sell new and pre-owned clothing, toys, video games, and much more all from the comfort of your home. Stop using half your day going through racks and racks of clothes without finding what you want. Instead, go to Swap.com and search any brand and see what's available in seconds and even narrow the search results to your specific needs. Even better, there is a return policy so if the clothing you buy does not fit, you can return your item without any hassle. Instead of throwing that old jacket in the trash or some of your old video games or toys that's been in the closet for the last three years, you can list it up on Swap.com and help another thrifter out. I am proud to announce that Swap.com is exclusively offering all of you a 40% off discount code for your first order on the site, plus free shipping if the order is over $10. The discount code is SCAREcast40, and this code is valid through December 31st. So be sure to utilize this code soon so you can stack up great value retail items up to 90% off for Christmas presents. The discount code is SCAREcast40 for 40% off at Swap.com. Please check the description for more information. Happy thrifting! We all had that one friend who's not into the holidays. You know the one. Won't decorate, won't dress up, won't wish you a happy whatever day it is. And though he'll reluctantly agree to come to your themed party, he'll stay in the back and scowl the whole time. In most cases, the hate is directed at just one holiday. Whether it be Valentine's, Christmas, Easter, or hell, even Arbor Day. My friend Patrick, he hated Halloween with every fiber of his being. Now Patrick hadn't always been that way. I'd known him since grade school, and we'd usually spend Halloween together. I noticed a sudden shift in his attitude around the time we got too old to go trick-or-treating, but too young to go out drinking. At first, I figured he was just being a normal angsty teenager. Maybe he thought Halloween was just for babies. Maybe he was pissed off about not being allowed to go trick-or-treating anymore. Or maybe it was just a phase. Damn if I knew. It wasn't until last year that I found out the real reason. It was a few days before Halloween, and I'd managed to drag Patrick to a costume party. Naturally, he'd shown up in his usual t-shirt and jeans and told the doorman he was dressed as a broke college student. He was in that state of semi-drunkenness, where he'd start slurring his words, but was still mostly coherent. Some chick wearing devil horns and almost nothing else ran into him, and I saw him flinch when he looked at her. He mumbled about how much he hated Halloween, and I finally got around to asking him why. That's when his face drained of color as though he hadn't had years to prepare his answer. He emptied his cup and shuffled nervously from foot to foot. His story started with, You're not going to believe this, but... When Patrick was 14, his parents left him home alone on Halloween night. Nothing unusual there. He was more than old enough to take care of himself. They left him with a bag of candy and put him in charge of handing it out to the neighborhood kids, but were adamant that he stop by 10 p.m., lock the doors, and turn off the porch lights. 10 p.m., they insisted, and not a minute later. There were enough kids that night that Patrick had to spend the first half of the evening sitting outside on the porch handing out candy to the seemingly endless procession of kids. Around 8.30 p.m., things quieted down enough for him to head inside, 
make some popcorn, and start watching a horror movie. He had to pause every few minutes to cater to another cluster of kids. But as the evening wore on, the visits came fewer and farther between, until he only had to get up every 10 minutes or so. He hadn't heard a peep for a good 20 minutes when he noticed a figure making its way up the driveway. Patrick rolled off the couch and checked the time. 10.08 p.m. Most kids have gone home already and were busy sorting through their candy. However, Patrick knew from experience that houses tended to give out more treats near the end of the night just so they can get rid of the surplus and close up shop. He figured this kid was trying his luck, hoping for a jackpot. It was too late to turn off the lights and pretend he wasn't home. So Patrick decided he'd give this kid the jackpot he deserved and would go dark as soon as he left. The figure rounded the corner as Patrick headed to the door. By the time he'd armed himself with a handful of candy and opened the door, the figure had reached the foot of the stairs. He realized then that the person just outside the beams of his porch light was much taller than the child. A parent, he figured. Maybe his kid had fallen asleep or was hiding under the thick black cloak he was wearing. The man's costume was strange. The fabric looked to be much higher quality than anything you could buy at the store, that's for sure. It was a thick, tattered cloak covered in chains that jangled with every movement. Two black horns protruded from the top of the hood, leaving frilled, frayed fabric all around the holes they'd torn. Trick or treat, trick or treat, give, give me something, something good, good to eat. eat, it bellowed. The voice was so unnatural that it sent a chill down Patrick's spine. He swore to me that it sounded like two people had spoken in unison. The figure took another step up the stairs, which brought him within the radius of the porch light. Patrick could now see he was wearing a goat's mask beneath his hood. Two pearly yellow eyes with slit pupils stared at him. He stared back. The mask was so lifelike. Its fur swayed softly in the breeze. Mist seemed to escape its wet nostrils. And the eyes looked real. Almost as though they had been ripped right off an animal and glued on while they were still fresh. And suddenly, the goat's eyes blinked. On instinct, Patrick shit. slammed the door shut and locked it. He could hear the patter of something thick as the figure climbed up the wooden steps. Patrick looked out the peephole hesitantly, hoping he was wrong, praying the men would take his mask off and start laughing at him. Trick or treat! treat. Trick or treat. treat! Give me something, something good, good to eat. eat! It said. Patrick watched as a long forked tongue slithered out of its maw and licked its lips with feverish hunger. He strained his vision enough to notice hooved feet clicking against the floor. Suddenly, it rammed into the door with all its might, over and over again. Patrick didn't know what else to do but to press himself against the door in hopes of keeping it shut and turning off the porch lights in a vain attempt at pretending he wasn't home. As soon as the lights went off, the creature seized its offense on the door. The clattering of its footsteps slowly moved towards the living room window. In a panic, Shit. Patrick darted no. into the living room and drew the curtain shut. As he did so, he noticed every other house on the street had already turned off their lights. He ran through the first door and turned off all the lights he could find, and then ducked behind the couch and hid. Thankfully, the sounds of rattling chains and hooves stopped. Patrick studied me as he told his story, almost as though trying to gauge whether or not I believed him. I didn't know what to say. It wasn't like him to spin yarns, but there was no way his story was true. It was probably some dude in a really good costume trying to freak you out. Mission accomplished, I reassured. 
Patrick shook his head and told me his story wasn't done. He continued. It had not been very hard for him to convince himself the whole thing had been in his head. He figured he'd had a sugar crash and dozed off mid-movie. It was all just a nightmare, nothing more. That is, until a year later, when Halloween rolled back around. He was home alone again, sort of. He snuck his girlfriend in as soon as his parents' car disappeared down the street. He and his girlfriend left a bowl of candy on the porch and shut the curtains so they could canoodle in peace. Throughout the night, between the shrill screams of bimbos getting mutilated on TV, they heard kids running up and down the front steps to grab Halloween candy. Again, as the night progressed, fewer and fewer kids showed up until the trick-or-treaters trickled to a stop. Neither Patrick nor his girlfriend thought to turn off the porch light when 10 p.m. ticked by. Before long, they heard the clunk of something heavy on the porch, followed by a strong knock at the door. Not noticing the time and thinking the bowl of candy needed to be filled, Patrick walked over and opened the door a crack. He saw a yellow eye and a rectangular pupil that darted from side to side until it fixed on him. Trick or treat! Trick or treat! Give me something good to eat! It said as a hooved foot kicked at the door. Patrick screamed and slammed into the door in an attempt to shut it, but the goat-headed stranger was putting all of its weight against it. It was a tug of war, or rather, a push of war, with the goat trying to open the door and Patrick trying to shut it. Beads of sweat rolled down his face as Patrick yelled at his girlfriend to help. Together, they managed to push it far enough to lock the deadbolt. But even then, the goat outside rammed against the door repeatedly. The door looked as though it was going to fall off its hinges. Patrick's girlfriend was screaming. She hadn't seen what was on the other side of the door, but she knew it was trouble. Hit the lights! yelled Patrick as he desperately pressed himself against the door. She flicked them shut and suddenly everything went quiet. They waited in the dark for a while, neither one daring to look out the door or pull open the curtains to see if the thing was outside. It wasn't until they heard the crackling of a car up the gravel driveway that the two finally relaxed. I stared at Patrick this time, in clear disbelief, it sounded like horseshit to me, or I guess I should say goat shit. Every year, he said, his tone dull and his gaze distant. He comes every year. If I have so much as one light on, no matter where I am, my parents' house, a girlfriend's, it doesn't matter. He finds me. I let out a chuckle and pat him on the back. I played it off as a joke, fully expecting him to crack a smile and tell me he was pulling my leg. He didn't. I changed the subject and bought him a drink. Halloween came and went, and I forgot all about his story. Which brings us to this Halloween. I was hosting a party at my place. I'd invited Patrick, but he'd refuse as usual. Suddenly, a few minutes past 10 p.m., my phone rang. It was Patrick. I picked up and said hello, but all I could hear were his sobs and the sound of violent banging on wood. Imagine the sound of your pissed off landlord knocking on your door demanding payment multiplied by 20. Patrick's mumbles were nearly indecipherable through his choked cries. The lights won't, he kept saying. I did not understand what he meant. The lights, he screamed. I heard what I thought was his door splintering open. There was a loud slam and the sound of jangling chains. Patrick screamed a scream so feral that I felt my body seize up. And then I heard it. I heard the most chilling voice 
I've ever heard in my life. A voice so cold, it ran daggers through my veins. A voice that reverberated through my speaker and seemed to have not one, but two sources. I don't mean there was an echo. I mean, it sounded like a man, but with that normal voice came one that was deeper and produced an unholy growl with every syllable. Trick or treat. Give me something good to eat, it uttered. I heard something being dragged. Patrick screams and the sounds of jangling became distant until I couldn't hear them anymore. I left my party and sped across town to Patrick's condo. All I found was his phone on the welcome mat, his door hanging off its hinges, and the dozen solar lights he'd installed in his flower bed this past summer. When I was a kid, I loved Halloween, probably more than Christmas. What kid doesn't love Christmas? Presents, Santa, all the great stuff. But for some reason, Halloween was my favorite time of the year. Hell, October itself was a month of pure bliss for me in my youth. I was walking on clouds whenever October 1st came around with a chill in the air. That meant soon something spooky would be happening. I think this is partially due to my older brother Danny. He loved Halloween too and made sure his love was passed down to me, his only sister. We would spend hours coming up with costume ideas together in his room. He loved to dress up in scary costumes and tried to get me to indulge him. I preferred princesses and fairies, sometimes a witch. I loved being scared, but I didn't think I had to be particularly scary. Danny would always roll his eyes, but grudgingly let me dress up as whatever my little heart desired. Danny was the one who took me out trick-or-treating every year. Our mother only had one rule, be back by 8 p.m., no later. We never questioned it. We were young enough where eight seemed late enough to be trawling the neighborhoods for free candy. And we always got a shitload of candy anyway. But what happened in that small little town last week will always haunt me. I had to write about it because I have a little cousin who lives in that town. And I don't think his mom believes me when I say that he shouldn't be outside after 8 p.m. on Halloween night. Last week was really exciting because Danny was 12 now and he felt as if he was old enough to stay out past 8. He whined that some of his friends were talking about holding a party and he was invited. My mother of course wouldn't hear of it. No, you can't stay out past 8, she told him, a raise of an eyebrow and we knew her word was not going to change. But, he said, one last lame attempt. I said no, now go finish your homework. My mother turned away from us and focused on chopping vegetables for our dinner later that evening. Whatever, Danny huffed. He stumped his foot before walking away. I looked up at my mother, who met my eyes and smiled sadly. I know he wants to go out, but you two need to trust me. It's better to be home and safe in bed she explained. I trusted my mom so I didn't question her. I was only eight at the time and felt no need to go against the grain. Still, I followed Danny upstairs and quietly knocked on this door. What do you want, Lucy? He sounded like he had been crying. Can I come in? I waited by the door, whereas normally I would have barged in demanding his attention. This time I knew I didn't want to make him mad. Whatever, he conceded. Upon entering his bedroom, I found his costume laid out on his bed, an elaborate pirate costume. He was leaning away from Scary and doing something with his friend group instead. Your costume looks super cool, I said. I sat on the bed gently avoiding the costume 
and looked at him. I'm sorry mom won't let you go to that party. I'm going anyway, he snorted. How? I asked, leaning forward. Mom said it's not safe. He looked up at me. I'm not some kid. I can handle being out a little later than eight at night, he said. Any other night I've got like an extra hour and I want to hang out with my friends. I just shook my head. Mom will find out. I said, only if you tell her, Danny said, and you won't because you'll be with me. I looked at my brother in confusion, but I want to be safe, I protested. I remember feeling doubtful. I didn't want to be out if it was dangerous, and a bad feeling started growing in my stomach. What, you think I wouldn't protect you, Luce? Danny asked, gently shoving my shoulder. There'll be kids your age too. Come on, it'll be fun. Since my brother rarely invited me out with his friends, I reluctantly agreed. I wanted to be cool to him, and he was the coolest person in my eyes. I didn't think I would regret it so much. So the night of Halloween came a lot more quickly than I had anticipated, and my mind was spinning with anticipation and fear. My mother had to work that night. She was a nurse, and it was awfully convenient. We would be able to sneak over to the party and be home by the time our mother got home. Or so we thought. The night started out normally enough. I was in a cheerleading costume, and my mother had done my hair up in tight pigtails before she left for work. My brother and I left around six or so to get the ultimate candy stash. He held my hand and walked me out around the neighborhood. It was a great night, honestly, until we hit 7.45 p.m. and started to walk to the party house. My stomach couldn't contain the butterflies it held, and I started to walk slowly. Lucy, come on, Danny sighed. It's just going to be a bunch of kids and their parents. So once again, Persuaded by my brother, we walked about a block until we got to the house. Party house indeed. There were a dozen kids chattering on the lawn and parents dropping them off with sleeping bags and pajamas. Danny looked confused. Oh crap, is this a slumber party? He asked me. How would I know? I looked up at him, shrugging. Danny let go of my hand and walked up to his friend. They talked for about a minute before Danny came running back to me. It is, he said, grinning. I must not have heard. We can just head to our house down the street and grab some PJs. They have spare blankets, okay? He held out his hand, and I looked at my watch. It was now 7.55 p.m. Our house was roughly a five-minute walk away. I don't know. We're outside past eight. My stomach did a flip, and Danny sighed. <sighs> it's okay. We'll actually be inside past eight, right? Because we'll be sleeping with lots of other kids, and we'll be totally safe, Danny urged, taking my hand and pulling me away from the crowded house and front yard. But I still couldn't shake my bad feeling. However, it was too late. The sky was dark, the doors were all closing, and I looked at my watch one more time, the one our mother made me wear every Halloween, 7.59 p.m. Danny stopped suddenly. What do you think is down there? He looked transfixed, and I followed his gaze to what looked like an unfamiliar side street. A part of me wondered how I hadn't noticed it before. We need to get home, I said. We're almost there. I tugged on his hand, but he dropped it completely and walked towards the street. There was a single street light on that street, and it seemed to be illuminating an old house. It looked like the kind of house you'd see in a scary movie, haunted with evil spirits and demons just ready to rip you to shreds. Danny was walking towards it, with a blank expression on his face, 
and I could feel a pull towards it myself. But the fear that was now running rampant in my stomach felt stronger, and I called out to my brother, Daddy, that's the wrong way! My voice came out shrill, and Danny didn't even flinch. He just kept walking. I watched him with terror growing in my chest. Finally, against my better judgment, I ran after him. I stopped once I was next to him and kept up with his slow pace. Look, I think that house has all the candy, he said to me. He sounded as if he was reciting an old and worn out line. No, I think we have enough, I said, but he kept going. I grabbed his hand and pulled, but he was stronger and ended up pulling me. I struggled and kept begging, but eventually we were right in front of that house. I looked around, a mist had surrounded us by now, and I couldn't see our street or the other houses around. My heart hammered in my chest, and I tugged at Danny once again. D -d Danny? I looked up at him, but he just shook his head. We were on the porch now, and I hear a meow. I look down and I see a black cat staring up at me, an intense gaze. I tugged on him again, but he just shrugged it off. He opened the door. I don't know why at this point, but when he walked in, I followed him. I knew I couldn't leave him alone. That was part of it. But my childhood self felt compelled to walk inside and see what awaited us. I don't remember much about the house. I just remember seeing a staircase and that we both walked up it. By now I was under the same spell my brother was. I do remember what came next. Danny opened a door and made a slow creaking sound and we both stepped inside the room. I felt now as if I was slowly regaining some sense of self-control and I looked around the room blinking. Where are we? I asked. Danny looked dazed. Uh, I don't know. How did we get here, Lucy? He looked at me. My brother again, all concerned and confused. Are you okay? Yes. I looked up at him. Can we go home? But he never answered me. Instead, we heard a creak on the floor. It sounded like someone or something was moving towards us. I looked up to see what could only be described as a thing. It was long arched back, and long fingernails on its right hand. It seemed to have a hook on its left hand, and I could feel its gaze, even with no eyes, penetrating us. I let out a scream at the same time as Denny, but my legs were rooted to the spot, and I couldn't move, even when I tried. Lucy, run! Danny yelled, not moving either gazing up at the creature. Then the creature came into the light, and it was grotesque. Rotting flesh, worms coming out where its eyes should be. I could see its teeth through where flesh was missing on the cheek. A sweet stench filled the room, and I gagged. Then the creature ripped out and grabbed Danny. I couldn't save him. I dodged the hook as it dug into my brother's chest and dragged him forward. Danny was screaming at this point, his eyes frantically darting around the room. Even in that moment, all he could scream was, RUN LUCY! As if I was still his number one priority, and even as the screams died out because of the pain he was in. The creature turned to me and stared at me with its worm-filled eye sockets. I couldn't move. The creature looked at me as it removed its hook from my brother's chest, and it almost smiled. Then it spoke. I love candy, and proceeded to slice open my brother's stomach, just like that. I won't describe what that looked like. 
All I know is that instead of trying to stop the creature or look at my brother, I turned around and ran. I heard his screams as I ran down the stairs and out the door. I ran past that stupid black cat still sitting on the porch and I ran through the fog until I was on my familiar street and even then I kept running. I ran until I was at that party house and started screaming and banging on the door. It took 10 minutes before it opened just a crack and the mother peeked out. What? She said in a harsh tone. My brother, please someone needs to help me. I was screaming and before I knew it, I was being pulled inside into strong arms and being comforted. Kids were staring as I cried into this woman's arms, babbling about a monster and my brother being cut open. Who did you let in? A man's voice asked. It's little Lucy from down the street. It's fine. I'm not leaving her out there. She answered. The rest of the night is a blur. They waited until about 10 p.m. to call my mom and tell her where I was. In the morning, the police were called and my mother came to pick me up. Where's your brother? Where did you see him last? She asked me in this panicked voice. He... I had no idea how to answer. All I know is that after she asked me, the police did as well. They of course didn't believe my full story and just said it was trauma. They never found his body either. They concluded some lunatic had been out and decided to close the case. That old town had a secret and it covered up my brother's death just to keep the secret safe. Be careful next Halloween, please, no matter where you are. If your parents ever say, don't go out past eight, they probably have good reasons. <laughs>